From pioneers like Herb Carnegie and Willie O'Ree to superstars like P.K. Subban, African-Canadian players have long graced the sport of hockey, often facing off against adversity that other players don't face. How is that changing? And is Canada's game starting to look a lot more like Canada? Kwame Mason joins us now for more. He is the writer, director, and producer of the documentary Soul on Ice, Past, Present, and Future. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I should start by telling everybody that you and I have known each other for... A long time. 20 years? Yeah, uh, 96, I believe. Okay, but it's funny because I'm only 21. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Great bow tie, by the way. Thank you very um, much. So let's start by showing a clip of the film. Okay. The black men of the community could not play hockey with the white hockey teams in the area. They were just segregated. We've got some season ticket holders that are complaining about bringing you here. I had to enter everything, all their name calling, the N word, I heard it all. He got death threats. You're playing the white man's game. You know that you can compete with the best, but you're the wrong color. For 12 years, we've been coming to hockey, and he's only the second one we've ever seen. Was there a discrimination issue, or was it simply the fact that he was too proud to go to the minor leagues? And you can find good arguments on both sides. There was racial slurs coming from every corner. Hey! The only way to get back at him is to win. First of all, why make a film about black <laughs> hockey players? Um, well, I, you know, uh... Growing up here, you know, my parents are from Guyana and, you know, first generation Canadian. They put us outside and one of the first things you do is you assimilate with the kids and what they're doing is playing hockey. So I've always been a fan of the game and I've always loved film, I've love, always loved cinema. So I felt that, you know, if I was going to do a project, it would have to be something that I'm very familiar with and something very passionate about. So I said, why not try and conquer something about hockey and, you know, I, um, I read an article about the Colored Hockey League in Nova Scotia, which was around in the 1800s. And when I read that, I was so blown away because I didn't know this information. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, not knowing this information, it made me think, like, if I don't know this, how many people in Canada, North America, don't know this information? So mm -hmm. once I read that and kind of took some, you know, more stock about the history of uh, black athletes in hockey, I thought to myself, you know, this would be a pretty interesting project to, uh, to take on. And what's your connection to the sport? Well, I played two years. No. I, I did, yeah. I did. I wasn't that good. I didn't really understand the game. But um, when I was living in Edmonton, um, doing my radio show there, I got to hang out with a lot of the Edmonton Oilers. And so I was always at games. So I was I felt so connected with those guys. I so I felt so connected with the sport and the city because the city's all about hockey. Um, I just, you know, I, I'm a nerd for hockey. Like I'm that guy on a Saturday night who's watching hockey till it's done. That, that that's my evening, hockey night in Canada. And uh, the Batman, right? Yeah, so yeah, so <laughs> comics and hockey. I'm a total nerd. Comics, hockey, and video games. That's it for me all day. Renaissance man, yeah. true Renaissance yeah, man. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, off the top of the t uh, conversation, we mm -hmm. showed you a clip of the film, and you said, "Wow." Mm hmm. Why? Well, you know, because um, like sometimes, like I've always wanted to do a film. This is my first film, and so. When I sit back and I look at it, I go, it, it, it trips me up because I'm like, here's something that I feel very proud of, and I hear something that I feel is so a part of Canadian history, and I was able to do that. So, you know, whenever I look at it, I kind of just get this little, you know, kind of proud of myself for what I did for um, the history of the game. And this is your first film. How did you learn how to make a film? Watched a lot of documentaries, yeah. read a lot of how-to books. I know that sounds weird, but <laughs> I literally would, I went to Kohl's, bought myself one of those, how to make a documentary, mm -hmm. and just kind of just study the craft. You know, um, the great thing about where we are in society today is, you know, you can really just pick up a camera and go, and it's all about your imagination, and it's all about your creativity. Mm -hmm. So I just, um, you know, I think everything that I've done, be it radio, be it television, I had to learn. I never, you know, I tried to go to like radio and television broadcasting school. I didn't get accepted. And I was always in the mindset that if you want to learn something, you just go out there and invest in yourself. So that's exactly what I did. And another, I guess you could call it another <coughs> character in the film is the music. Yes. And which is predominantly hip hop. Yeah. When you think of hockey, you don't really think of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Was that a, 
why did you decide to incorporate the two? Well, for exactly what you said there was, um, you know, when people think of hockey, you don't really can't have the um, connection of hip hop, and I really wanted to throw off the senses. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy from the Hockey News magazine who came and watched it like the very first time I kind of showed it to a group of hockey players. Yeah. And he said to me, he said, Kwame, you know, something was throwing me off throughout the whole documentary and I couldn't figure it out until the yeah. end. And I realized it was hockey because I've never seen hip hop mixed with, with hockey before. And so yeah, I purposely did that because I really wanted to show people how beautiful the game looks over hip hop music. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I think some people really get it, and some people just consciously get it, but don't really understand why it's been. It kind of makes sense to me because hockey, a lot of young players, mm -hmm. and hip hop is music for young people. So yeah. kind of, oh, I yeah. said young people. Oh yeah. my gosh, we're I'm old. getting old. Are we old? <laughs> We, old, we, were, we were those guys back then. We back were then, ones. no, we're one of the old ones. But, um, yeah, but those kids yeah. nowadays, like if you go to any hockey arena and you go in their dressing rooms, mm. pre-game, they're listening to hip hop. It's not like, you know, back in the days where it's just country music and rock music. You know, these kids now, you ask them, what, do you, what, what kind of music do you listen to? They just say, well, you know, whatever I'm into. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like they're, they're not segregated by, by music and by culture. And this idea of segregation, you talked about mm -hmm. how you used to play hockey. Yeah. So growing up, was there that much of a racial divide? Um, what was it like? <clears throat> well, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't the sense of a racial divide. You Like in hockey? You understood you were kind of different, and mm -hmm. you, you understood the makeup of, well, uh, you know, not too many people that look like me play this game. You know, um, I remember when I was six years old, and we're playing ball hockey with our friends. And this is in the movie, I, I tell the story about, you know, when you're picking your favorite player that you're going to be that game, I, I would always pick Guy Lafleur. And this one game, this kid said, I can't be Guy Lafleur because he's white. So that's kind of the first time I actually thought to myself, well, who can I be if I can't be this person? And, um, you know, when I played, I was the only black kid on my team. Now, no one, no one made me feel that way, but at the same time, I wasn't um, brought into the fold. I didn't really understand. And hockey is a very information-based sport. So you always have to share information. So if you're not included, then you know there's only so far you can go. It's like other people decided that because you didn't look like the other hockey players, you wouldn't, that wasn't something for you. Mm. So you kind of took that on yourself too. Eh? Yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what anybody else on that team was thinking, mm -hmm. if they were thinking that about me or not. I didn't, you know, I didn't think that or feel that in that sense. I just kind of knew that, you know, I look around and it's just like myself, mm -hmm. you know, and you become conscious of that. And um, I remember like being in junior high school and, you know, my friends were predominantly black at that point. And mm -hmm. so I did what they did. And hockey was considered the white boy sport. So, you know, Again, for a first, it was a, probably the first time I really pigeonholed myself. And I think in our culture, sometimes that's what we do. We say, this is what black people do, and this is what black people don't do. And, um, you know, growing up, it was basketball, football, maybe baseball, but it wasn't hockey. And so that was a shame for me back then because, you know, I really enjoyed the sport. And it's interesting because the relationship between black players in hockey, it's been long, and mm -hmm. you brought it up a little bit. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about the Colored Hockey League. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was that? Well, um, so when you know, blacks in America left because of like the Civil War and slavery and all that, and they came through the Underground Railroad, one of the places they came was Halifax, Nova Scotia. And so once that community was starting to get established, like in Africville, um, you know, they wanted to kind of assimilate to what the country was doing. And, you know, hockey was a sport that everybody was being introduced to. And so a couple of um, pastors and people from the church, church organization tried to, you know, bring in more um, young men into the, into the fold. And, you know, they started this league. So they were like, come to church and you can play hockey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a lot of the guys were um, baseball players in the spring. So they would play hockey in the winter to keep themselves fit. And so, you know, because they couldn't play with the white leagues and the white players in the community, they just started their own league and started to, you know, charge admission, um, organize challenges through the newspaper, and really had like spectacles. They were having like 2,000 people at their um, games, and it was mostly white crowds because they would entertain the, the crowd in between periods and mm -hmm. stuff, and the game was very fast, very innovative, and um, 
you know, it was just a way to feel a part of um, Canada, you know, and so they had to take it on themselves to, to start this league. Now, there are some elements that mm -hmm. the Colored Hockey League uh, created that the yeah. NHL took on. What are some of those elements? Yeah, well, um, what was very interesting in, in, in my research, finding out about, um, you know, some of the innovations that they, they brought into the game that we still see today. For example, the players in the, uh, the, the, the Colored um, Hockey League played baseball in the, in the, sum in the summer. And they took that element of baseball into hockey. So for example, when they swung at the puck, they swung at the puck like they were swinging at a baseball and they call it a baseball shot, mm -hmm. which as we all know is, is, a, is a slap shot. Yeah. And um, the, the white goalies um, weren't allowed to go down on the ice, but the black goalies were, and it became what was known now as the butterfly style of goaltending. So um, a lot of that, and you know, down to down to entertainment at halftime and stuff like that, there are, are stuff that we see in sports now being incorporated and these guys were doing this in the early 1800s and you have to also remember that the colored hockey league is the first organized league of blacks mm -hmm. throughout north america so before the rents and the harlem globetrotters and the negro baseball league there was this hockey yeah league. we know about the harlem Glob globetrotters mm -hmm. but we don't know about the colored hockey league yeah. what happened to it well <clears throat> you know uh, there's so many different variations and versions to the story of why the the league mm -hmm. stopped but you know, one of the biggest things was just, you know, around that time, it wasn't easy for blacks and whites to get along. And, you know, whites controlling that area, they, you know, uh, some say it was started from just the sheer place of this is there was a marketplace that the you know um, the, the whites were trying to take over and they were ta uh, they were trying to move out blacks and because blacks were fighting back and going to the court of law to, to get their rights, you know arenas and all these places were just punishing the leagues until they finally had to fold because they had nowhere to play. They, they were getting crappy rinks and, um, you know, the numbers were just going down and it just stopped. Now, the NHL was founded almost 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. How reluctant were they to draft black players? Well, I think what it was is the interest wasn't there, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With baseball, and they had, you know, with Jackie Robinson, there was a conscious effort to try and bring, you know, um, integrate the game slowly but surely at some point. Um, hockey never really had that. Mm -hmm. um, they never really opened the doors because when the league folded, it just kind of like dispersed. Whereas, example, like with the Negro Baseball League, you know, once they brought in Jackie Robinson and he was such a good player, mm -hmm. they started to see more, more guys out there and they started collecting guys um, from different teams and bringing them into the Major Baseball League. But it never happened with hockey. Why? Um, you know, in my research, I really you can never really get a real answer. Like, who's mm -hmm. going to really say why? Mm -hmm. I just think there just wasn't an interest. There wasn't um, any interest to go to grab uh, players of color to bring them into the fold. Because you got to remember, you know, when the the league started, when the NHL started, there was only six teams. Right. So there was a lot of jobs that were not able to be filled because you know there was just not enough teams. So. If there's not enough teams and there's a lot of guys around that time, they probably weren't looking for black players. They were just looking for um, good players that were in the pro in their in their um, their in their area. Mm -hmm. So they're looking more at the white. There guys. wasn't a need to go out looking for yeah, like, exactly. other players. Um, you profile a number of notable uh, hockey players, mm -hmm. of black hockey players. Uh, first, Mr. Carnegie. Mm -hmm. Who is he? Or well, who was he? Well, Herb Carnegie was. Um, one of the best players to play in the NHL, or not to play in the NHL, mm -hmm. and some say that was due to his color. He was fast, um, uh, just a very skilled guy uh, on the ice. Um, he mentored Jean Beliveau. Jean Beliveau would have, he, he's quoted as saying how great Herb Carnegie was, how, mm -hmm. um, how better Herb Carnegie was than him. And he was also very surprised that he never had a chance to play in the NHL. Um, you know, he went on, had a good career in the minor mm -hmm. leagues. He didn't, um, he didn't get that opportunity, but um, in that, he was able to, to um, start the very first uh, hockey school in all of North America. Mm -hmm. um, he started a creed called the Future Aces Creed, which is you can find in a lot of the Toronto public schools. And um, each year, they give away scholarships. So. You know, he's also got his own arena now. So he's a huge fixture in the hockey world. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. Where's the arena? Um, the arena is on Young and, Young and Finch, mm -hmm. Centennial Arena. Um, if you're a hockey kid in mm -hmm. Toronto, you know that arena. Yeah. And everybody has played there. And they, 
they renamed it the Herb Carnegie Arena because he grew up in that area. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he was a great man, and I was so honored to uh, to interview him and have his very last interview before he passed away. What was away. that like? I mean, at the time, you probably didn't know that would yeah. be it, but what was it like to meet him? Well, the, the thing was, when I decided to do this film, and I was doing my research, I was looking at his Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. and I realized how old he was, and I was like, oh boy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 92 years old, if, if I want his story, I gotta get this now. So. You know, when I got to meet him, it was really interesting because, you know, he was suffering from dementia, right? But when you talked about hockey, he was on point. He knew exactly what you're talking about. He knew exactly all of his old stories. So that was a joy to speak to him. And the, the, the part that really got me was when um, we were finished the interview and, you know, he's, he, he, he held my hand. He said, will you come back and visit me? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll come back, I'll come back. And I never did. Mm -hmm. And then a week and a half later, he passed away. So um, it, it was interesting. You know, it took me three years to do this documentary. And it was very frustrating at times. There were some times I didn't think that I'd be able to complete it. Mm -hmm. But um, my screensaver was a picture of myself and Herb Carnegie. And every time I looked at that, I, say, I said to myself, there's no way God will allow me to do this interview with this man and not allow me to complete this film. So I'd always look at that and everything was uh, sunshines. That's really cool. Yeah. 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 Um, another player that you interviewed was Willie O'Ree. Mm -hmm. Who was he? Willie O'Ree is the first black athlete to play in the NHL in 1958. Um, another man that's, that, that um, is very dear to the hockey world mm -hmm. because of his work outside of the game right now, which is um, you know, spreading the word of diversity in, mm -hmm. in, in, in hockey. So he's a part of the Hockey is for Everyone program. Yeah. So he goes around all of North America and he just speaks diversity. But yeah, he played in 1958. He opened up the, uh, the door basically for you know, players of color to play in the NHL. Um, unfortunately, when he played, he, play, he, 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 had, uh, he was in the league with only one good eye. How did he do that? So yeah. he was half blind, he was playing half blind. Yeah. How did he manage to do that and be so well, good? What it was, is, you know, he says he, he, he had to focus on what he could see. Mm -hmm. So he didn't bother what, with what he couldn't see, so he just focused on what he could see. So um, there's no, I don't know, it's, it's, you know, hockey's a hard sport to play with two eyes, let alone with one eye. So it's an amazing feat to be able to play. but. You, you, I think of it this way, like, I mean, as good as he was to be able to make it into the NHL with one eye, imagine if he had two good eyes. Because he didn't really have the impact that, say, a Jackie Robinson did when he played in Major League Baseball. Um, he was there, he, he, you know, he did his thing, but it, it didn't open the eyes of anybody to say, oh, we got to find more black athletes. Because it was 14 years after he finished playing in the NHL, that the, the second black athlete played. So that's kind of a shame too, but he's another guy whose legacy is, is, is um, huge in the world of hockey. Do you think he should be in the Hockey Hall of Fame? I do believe so. I believe he should be there. Him and Herb Carnegie should be there as builders mm -hmm. because of their work outside the game. I, I, Herb Carnegie more so, just for the simple fact that, you know, hockey schools are all over. You can go anywhere, you ask anybody about a hockey school, they'll tell you there's a hockey school down the street. Mm -hmm. there, at, at, at some point, there was no hockey schools. He had the foresight to start off the very first hockey school. Um, you know, there's a board. That most most teams now use tablets mm -hmm. when uh, when they're coaching. But back in the days, they used to have hockey boards, and they would just kind of move the guy around and show where they're doing the plays. Herb Carnegie is the one who created that. And there was a game called Pass and Shoot. So do I think he should be in the Hall of Fame? Oh, most definitely. Heck yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So really, Willie O'Ree was the first black man to join the NHL, but mm. he wasn't the first person of color. No. That honor goes to Larry Kwong, a Chinese Canadian. Yeah. Um, tell us what you learned about other hockey players of color while making this documentary. Yeah, um, I mean, the <clears throat> biggest thing I learned about was, was, was um, Larry Kwong, um, again, uh, first Asian uh, Chinese player to play in the NHL, first player of color to play in the NHL. But the interesting thing is he played for like literally a shift. And now for those who don't know hockey, a shift is maybe like 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So he literally jumped on, mm -hmm. skated around for 30 seconds and then came off and that was it. But the great thing about Larry Kwong is around that time, those times in like the 40s, 
40s and 50s, he was like, it was like Lynn Sanity mm. back then. Mm -hmm. So when he'd go to New Jeremy York. Jeremy Lynn from oh, the, yeah. oh yeah, from uh, Jerry Lynn from, from, from NBA. From, yeah, from the NBA mm -hmm. and what he did with uh, um, New York mm -hmm. uh, Knicks. It was the same thing for him, for Larry, mm -hmm. back in the days when he was in New York. Um, there's so many articles written about him. Chinatown would just open up the whole streets for him. Um, uh, and you know, the funny thing of uh, talking to Mr. Kwong is, you know, his story was similar to players uh, of, of, of African descent. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same, it paralleled the same discrimination, the same feeling of, um, of uh, being alone, but with teammates feeling like it was a community. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that was interesting that not only black athletes went through, through that same difficulty, but other athletes of color did the same. I want to talk more about that uh, racism in the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, your film uh, documents one incident in Salem, Virginia, involving Val James, yeah. a defenseman with the Buffalo Sabres. Let's look a look, but a warning, uh, some of the language is not suitable for young viewers. The chant of spook, spook, just one epithet from a poison garden of racial slurs flung at Val James when he plays hockey in Salem, Virginia. What they wanted was just a hockey story of, of, of a black man playing hockey and getting along, but what they got was a, a totally different story. In 1981, Val James was the subject of a CBS News feature that ended up being more about race than about hockey. And just remember, this is 1981. There was racial slurs coming from every corner. I mean, that language is just, it's just not offensive to young viewers. It's offensive, period. Yeah. Um, how typical was that kind of abuse? You know, it, it, back then it was really hard for those guys because he, hockey is a game where you have to be so focused, especially before your game. You've got to, you know, you've got to get into your zone. And not only did these guys have to focus on their game, they had to focus on what would happen in the stands, through opposing players, uh, whatever it may be. And How does that affect a player's psyche when they're? Well, you got to think about it. it, yeah. it it's got to, it's got to, it's got to throw you off in a in, in a in a way. But um, manage correctly, it can make you strong, mm -hmm. because you got to think about it. If you're able to go out there, like George Rock told me a story about his parents telling him he should quit. He said, you know, you might as well forget about playing hockey. This is not worth it. What you're hearing in the stands and all these other, it's just not worth it. But he said to his parents at the age of 10, if I quit, they win. So that mindset can make you stronger because you know now, it's like, okay, I gotta focus on my game, but I also have to focus on having these distractions out of my head and not letting them throw me off. So. A lot of those guys I find were very courageous, and um, one of the themes through, uh, throughout my film is perseverance through adversity. And so, you know, no matter if guys in the stand had watermelons throwing um, batteries at them or whatever comments were made, these guys were able to um, uh, persevere through those adversities. And the parents had to go through it too. I mean, there's stories of um, uh, biracial parents you know, mother white, father black, but the mother's in the stands, and having to sit there and hear people just say, say the most atrocious things about their children, and they have to either take it or they have to defend it. So, um, you know, I think it's a lot better now. Is it gone completely, or is it just more subtle? I don't think it's. I don't think it's gone completely because you know, after my film um, played on the NHL Network in the United States, I got a lot of letters and um, calls from from parents. Mm -hmm. Who, who were telling me that you know, um, you know, their kid was going through, you know, name calling and feeling like he was an outsider. But the film allowed them to feel that they, you know, they were a part of it and they weren't the only ones going through that. So it gave them a sense of strength. So, does it still happen? Yes, I think it will, it will continue to happen. Like I mean, it's just like saying, will racism ever end in our world? No. Mm -hmm. You just have to, it's how you deal with it and what you're going to do. It's either you're going to, um, either you're going to fight through it mm -hmm. or you're going to let it destroy you.
Um, finally, Drake is a big boost for the Toronto Raptors. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to see like someone like Jaden Lindo rocking a Leafs jersey? I would love to see Jaden play in a Leafs jersey, but I just want to see him in the NHL. Yeah. Um, as far as Drake goes with the whole Toronto Raptors. That's... Who is Jaden? Sorry for Oh, Jaden. Oh, so Jaden is my, my subject. I call him my Denzel Washington. <laughs> I'm Spike. He's Denzel. So he's my young player that I follow in his draft year from the OHL to see if he makes it into the AHL. Um, I really wanted to show him and his family. I wanted to show a strong black family, mother, father, son, daughter, um, just a great family unit so that, you know, we can show a different portrayal of the black family unit on television. But that's my guy right there, and I'm just so proud of him, and I'm so proud that he was my subject in the film. And if you rocked, uh, what jersey do you want him to ultimately wear? Ah, uh, you know, I would love to see him in the Toronto Maple Leafs jersey, but at the same time, I just want to see him reach his goal. I just want to see him in an NHL jersey, and I'll be happy with that. Well, congratulations on the documentary. Thank you. And I'm really sorry to hear about the loss of your mother. Okay, I didn't even yes. know that. And, um... You know, what's interesting, sorry mm -hmm. if you have the time, but mm -hmm. um, that was another blessing in disguise. You know, when my mom passed away, um... <clears throat> The, the, the first year of her anniversary was the first day I shot my documentary. It was with Herb Carnegie. So it was very special. And the whole, that's, that's why I dedicated the film to my mom and my brother. Well, she'll be very proud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's so glad to see you doing your thing. I know. I'm so proud of you. I need too. one of those Batman bow ties. You definitely do. <laughs> you definitely do. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.